John Piper once wrote, what I've learned about, from about 20 years of serious reading is this. It is sentence that sentences that change my life, not books. What changes my life is some new glimpse of truth, some powerful challenge, some resolution to a long-standing dilemma. And these usually come concentrated in a sentence or two. I don't remember 99% of what I read. Me too. But if the 1% of each book or article I do remember is a life-changing insight, then I don't begrudge the 99%. And that life-changing insight usually comes in a moment, a moment whose all value is out of proportion to its little size. I think this equally applies to conversational evangelism. Most Mormons probably won't remember most of what you tell them, in my judgment. But they will remember some sentences, at least. Right? Sentences change lives. Or more accurately, the Holy Spirit changes lives, and he loves to use your sentences. You are here today because at some point in your life, someone spoke sentences to you, something hopefully rooted in the Bible. The seed of the sower is sentences. People get saved because they either hear or read sentences, biblical sentences, and the Lord open, opens their heart to hear and believe. I named my daughter Lydia because in Acts 1614 says the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Evangelism is painting a picture. That's what it is. We're painters of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, primarily painting that picture with sentences. In Galatians 3. 1 to 2, Paul said, You fools! It was before your eyes that Christ, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing? You guys. Hearing you guys with faith. Well, hearing what? <laughs> Gospel sentences. That publicly portrayed Christ is crucified. So be encouraged. This is just my little pep beginning. God loves to use the sentences that you guys speak. I challenge you guys, every one of you, to pick one topic, either in this packet or not, and just memorize three biblical sentences. All right, if you feel ill-equipped to be here, well, I felt ill-equipped when I came to Salt Lake City 10 or so years ago. I read these books, and I showed up on the street, started talking to people, and I froze up. And the only thing I could tell them was what I had treasured in my heart, Psalm 51. <laughs> so, also, real quickly, to those of you who totally feel out of place here, <laughs> just like, you know, mm. or it's just awkward, or maybe, like, your gifts just aren't, you know, if, like, you know, my gifts just, like, what am I going to do here? Like, I'm better at other stuff. Um, Here's a cool passage for you in 1 Peter 4. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Wow. Wow. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So any of, any of you people out there just praying? Great. Any of you out there just being brotherly support out there? Great. If any of you out there handing out balloons or doing mosquito spray or whatever, then you know what? We value you. We love you. You're here for a reason. And... You obey 1 Peter 4. All right. 1st of four topics. First, I did the three, and then I had to stick in this one because it was just like, how can I not do this one? God is the most high. All right. In Isaiah 43.10, by the way, get your pens out and pencils out, please, because if anything, you're going to forget most of what I say today, right? 
So write down some sentences that to you are compelling and that you want to remember. You'll be more of an active listener that way. This will be more productive. It won't be as much of a waste of time for you. In Isaiah 43.10, God bears it. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit like just Mormons in the crowd and I'm preaching, all right? God bears his testimony to you. He is, he's up on the podium. He's bearing his testimony. He says, before me, there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. And God bears his testimony again in Isaiah 44, verse 6. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Is there a God beside me? I don't know of any others. There's no rock other than I. There's some flavored Trinitarian monotheism here. Isaiah 48, 9, 10, 11. This is important because Mormons need not, and we need not merely know the oneness of God and the triunity of God. But this is, the best way I can think of this, this is the flavor of Trinitarianism. What, what is God doing? What's his purpose? For my name's sake, I, perf- I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. For my own sake, comma, for my own sake, I do it. How should I let, for how should I let my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. Psalm 90 verse 2, David. God says through David, Before the mountains are brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thou art God. And even if there are a bunch of gods out there, sometimes the Bible refers to gods as imaginary deities of the pagan nations. And sometimes it's referring to just heavenly beings. We call them angels. We call them demons. Whatever. God can squash them like bugs. For you, O Lord, are most high above all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. So you want to say, Lord's many, God's many? Sure. My God's way above them all. They should all bow down and worship my God. If there's a heavenly grandfather out there, he should worship my God. <laughs> Psalm 135, 3-5. Three, three Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. Romans 11, 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. <laughs> Who has ever known the mind of the Lord? Who's ever taught God anything? Who's, I've lost my place. Who has ever been his counselor? Who's ever been God's Sunday school teacher? Who's ever given God a gift that he might be repaid? God says, oh, thank you very much. I didn't have that. No. (laughs) For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's the flavor of Trinitarian monotheism right there. (laughs) Revelation 4, 8. Holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Even Mormon scripture affirms this. The earlier stuff, anyway. In Mosiah 3, 5, the Lord God omnipotent, who reigns, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity. Mosiah 7, 22, God knowing all things, being from everlasting to everlasting. How does God know everything, according to the Book of Mormon? He's been from everlasting to everlasting. God. We're at 18. Gosh, I wish Mormons would doctrinally, at least, believe this stuff. It's in their own Book of Mormon. For I know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being, but he is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity, not just some eternities, from all eternity to all eternity. It doesn't stop. DNC 2017, by these things we know, there is a God in heaven, infinite and eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, this is good stuff, theologically, at least, these verses. DNC 76, verse 4, from eternity to eternity, he is the same, and his years never fail. What's up with this? Well, 14 years later, after the publication of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith preaches the King Fault Discourse, and he says, 
God himself was once as we are now and as an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. Where do you think that they got that idea? That's what we just read from the Book of Mormon in the DNC. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea. <clears throat> And take, take, and take away, and do away the veil, so that you may see, here then is eternal life, and to know the only wise and true God. And you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to, gods, to God, the same as all the gods have done before you. So here's a little couplet you should tuck away in your, for your conversational use. The Lorenzo Snow couplet, popular in Mormonism, as man, it always starts with man in Mormonism. As man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. I had a couple conversations on Saturday, too, with a young 17 and 18 year old, and then some, like, three kids that were like 10, 11. And, uh, I mean, and they're younger, I, you know, to just be more raw and honest, and they're like, I don't believe God ever sinned. He's always been God. Do you think we, you can become God someday? Pff, what are you talking about? And I don't, I don't doubt them when they say that. Little kids like that. They're adults. Cult Mormonism has this cultural epidemic of deception sometimes. But the kids, though, I'm like, you're telling me the truth. So I look at them and I say, that's a beautiful belief. Don't you let the church take that away from you. All right? God never sinned. He's the most high. He's not relative. Right, John Caleb? God is the best. John Caleb asked me, Daddy, what's the Mormon? He asked me that. What am I supposed to say? I said, well, Mormons are very nice people who believe God has a grandpa, right? <laughs> and we believe that God is the best. I mean, he's the strongest, he's the smartest, he's the top God. There's nobody above him or beside him. Can God win all the battles? He can win all the arm wrestling matches? That's God. That's awesome. Okay, second topic, priesthood. So, in Exodus 29, God's giving his people an identity, a covenant. He says, you keep my commandments, but when you don't, a priesthood structure, a temple. And he, he consecrates the tenet of meeting in the altar, and he says, Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. So it's really interesting to me that the term Aaronic priest is not really in the Bible. Um, I think Mormonism is a lot of baggage by that term. It's really just Aaron and his sons, the priests, Aaron, you know, the lineage of Aaron. It's interesting. Um, but if you wanted to be a priest in the Old Testament, you had to do your genealogy, and it had to go back to Aaron. There were even some stories in the Old Testament of some Levites who were non-Aaronites, and they were like, hey, us too, and uh, they died, so... Um, there's, a, there's a popular verse in Mormonism, I mean, young men especially, claiming this ironic priesthood for themselves. And they, it, it baffles me, but they quote Hebrews 5.4, and I'm so looking forward to them quoting this. They say, and no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. I think the point there is authority, authenticity, approval from God. But Mormons, when they read that, they're largely thinking of, we were even ordained as Aaron, Aaronic priests the same way the priests in the Old Testament were. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and so this is, this is really good like living room stuff with Mormon missionaries. I said, well, do you know what chapter in the Bible just entirely talks about how the Aaronic priests got ordained? Like, no. Well, let's look at it. Exodus 29. If you've got some time on the street, oh, um, if you've got some time in a conversation, just, just slowly read through the whole thing. I mean, uh, this list comes from Hal Hoagie, by the way. They were washed with water, dressed in priestly robes, anointed with oil, and then it gets, starts to get a little strange for them. They laid their hands on another, another priest. Another priest laid their hands on them. Nope. No, 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 no. They laid their hands on the head of a bullock. And the bullock was killed, and its blood was poured out on the altar. All the fat and the kidneys were placed in the altar, and the rest was burned outside the camp as a sin offering. Then they laid their hands on a ram. 
And the ram was killed, his blood was sprinkled on the altar, and the, blood, and the body was burnt, offered as a burnt offering. Then they laid their hands on the head of another ram. That one was killed, and then some of the blood of, on the altar and some anointing oil was sprinkled on the priests and the garments. They were given parts of the ram and three kinds of bread, and those were waved as a wave offering. Then they were burned on the altar. I mean, just, 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 I mean, if you're in a living room with Mormon missionaries, just read it slowly and just get through all the details. The breast of the ram was given to, to the one who ordained. And just remember, you guys don't have to remember all these details. Just remember Exodus 29. That's all you got to remember. The breast of the ram was given to the one who ordained them. The shoulder was given to them. Okay, okay, you guys get it, you get it. So, what are we to make of the Aaronic priesthood? Well, what's the key chapter in the New Testament that speaks of the Aaronic priesthood? I, I, I can't even think of anywhere outside of Hebrews that where the Aaronic priesthood is even mentioned. Uh, maybe, maybe there's something, but... Um, Hebrews 7 talks at length explicitly about the Aaronic priesthood. So, so you can encourage your LDS neighbors and friends and strangers. I always include that third one because people want to do it only do the first two. But um, You can talk to the, your LDS neighbors about Hebrews being the Aaronic priesthood manual for New Testament Christians, right? So here's the setup. Melchizedek was a type of Christ to come. And uh, there's this comparison made between Melchizedek and Jesus. And uh, it's really about two people. It's not about this ordained line of priests. One ordains the other, ordains the other. In fact, look at verse 11. Another priest, singular, after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron. 7.15, another priest, like Melchizedek appears. Four resemblances between Christ and Melchizedek. Melchizedek just shows up in Genesis. No genealogy. Where did this dude come from? This is weird. It was without father, without mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. And Smith saw this verse as a threat. So he puts a wrecking ball to it in the Joseph Smith translation. And he says, uh, For this Melchizedek was ordained a priest after the order of the Son of God, which order, the order was without father or mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And all those, Joseph Smith, see, the, see where he's going? All those who are ordained under this priesthood are made like unto the Son of God, abiding a priest continually. No, no, Smith, you missed the point. Resemblance number two. He was called Melchizedek. By translation of his name, it says, King of Righteousness. He's also the, called the King of Salem, that is, the King of Peace. Obviously, pointing to Jesus. Resemblance three. This is a little complicated. He's superior to Abraham and Levi and his sons. And that's proven by, work with me here, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek when Abraham was coming back from some battles and had the spoils of war, victory. He pays a tithe to Melchizedek. And um, it's as, figuratively speaking, Levi and Aaron and his sons are, were like in the loins of Abraham, you know, in a manner of speaking. And so the way, think about it later, go read it later. But, it's as, but the, the, the idea is Levi and Aaron, they're inferior to Melchizedek, all right? And, and the idea is that Jesus is also superior to the sons of Aaron. Um, okay, fourth. Melchizedek he was an Aaronic priest, and he wasn't even a priest based on lineage. Verse 14. It is evident our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Christ became a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent. So here's the point. We're getting back to the ironic stuff here soon. The new covenant, this is really important. Stop, listen to this. The new covenant, the new temple, and the new priest are one. The old covenant and the old priesthood and the old law are one. The author of Hebrews doesn't want you to think of those things as separate. 
He speaks of the old law, old covenant, old priesthood, old temple structure as one big organic inseparable unit. It's all gone. So, um, the new covenant of our high priest, Jesus. I love asking Mormons, who's your high priest? And they're like, Bishop, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, no. Who is your high priest? I'm like, okay, stake president? I don't know. I'm like, no. Who is your high priest? Jesus is the last and final high priest. Okay, but here's the point. The old priesthood, old covenant, old law, fulfilled by Jesus and set aside, not supplemented. It, it's, it did not... It, I didn't finish the sentence. It didn't... Uh, it, it wasn't merely an, a, a supplemental upgrade to the Old Covenant and the Aaronic Priesthood. It set aside it and it fulfilled it. Listen to these verses. And this is important because Mormons will say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Melchizedek Priesthood is the higher priesthood. And the, and the Aaronic Priesthood is the lower priesthood. And we have both. No, listen to this. 712. And when the priesthood is changed, the law must change also. Must be changed also. By the way, premise. The priesthood changed. The priesthood changed. That's the former regulation is set aside because it is weak and useless. Did you know that the Hebrews 7 says that the Aaronic priesthood, its law and its old temple structure, its old covenant is weak, useless, and obsolete. That's what, wow. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Seems like he's writing before the destruction of the temple in 8070. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And what's the, what's the definitiveness here? Why is one just set aside? Why is one obsolete and weak and useless? Where there is forgiveness of these, of sins, there is no longer any offering of sin. That's the reason. To abandon Christ's eternal priesthood for the temporal ministry of the sons of Aaron and Hebrews was considered an abandonment of the faith. So, we have Hebrews 7. We have the Old Testament teachings of what it, t what it took to be an Aaronic priest, how you were ordained. Well, how does the New Testament speak now of priesthood? How do we practice? Okay, stop. How do we practice our priesthood duty? What's our priesthood power? As you come to him, 1 Peter 2 says, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Women, children, young and old. Women, men, young and old, yeah. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's interesting that just this new temple language is reoriented. Um, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That, and here's my priesthood power, my priesthood duty, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into light. That's what priests do in the New Testament. But what about authority? Mormons are really concerned. But I need, like, priesthood ordination. I need a priesthood leader over me who can bequeath. Authority. What, by what authority could I baptize or evangelize? Or, I mean, I, you know, priests, uh, they have, or the missionaries, they have, LDS, they have cards in their wallets that give them authorization to preach the gospel. And, uh, wow. Um, did I skip something? Yeah, I skipped a whole section, didn't I? <laughs> wow. So, Matthew 18. We'll come back to that. If you flip back to the other page, God grows his kingdom and keeps his people. Matthew 18, or sorry, Matthew 28, 28, 28. And Jesus, just, just think here, how does Jesus authorize you to believe certain things and to do certain things? Well, the answer's in this text, all right? And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore... Go! <laughs> Who needs a card in your wallet? He vocalized the authority. 
Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And this is the way I like to put it. The mouth, this is help you remember, help you remember it. The mouth of Jesus is more authoritative than the hands of Mormon priests. If Jesus says to clean my room, I don't need priesthood papers. If Jesus says my sins are forgiven, they're forgiven. If Jesus says go, I can go. So, in light of what the Bible says about the qualifications of being an Aaronic priest, about the manner of ordination of Aaronic priests, of the functions of the Aaronic priesthood, I mean, they're just be, they're mainly temple duties, of the fulfillment and setting aside by Christ of the Old Covenant and its Aaronic priesthood, why would we want to adopt, and circle this term, why would we want to adopt a conspiracy theory of the, the, that the New Testament church really taught that the Aaronic priesthood was to be indefinitely perpetuated and extended to Gentiles and, and defined as Mormons do today. I mean, really, one of, the most alter, one of the most popular options or alternatives to believing what the Bible says is conspiracy theories. And you're asking me to believe a conspiracy theory of the Word of God. That all these New Testament manuscripts just scattered throughout the regions. And somehow the uh, corrupt, powerful church was able to get their little dirty fingers into all of them and to change all the different manuscripts. So just so happened, so we don't have any evidence today, of the extension of the Aaronic priesthood to Gentiles. Just, it's a conspiracy. No, I'll take Jesus over that. In light of what... In light of the specific ways that Christ and Melchizedek, the two, resemble each other, of the uniqueness of Jesus as high priest, of the, sufficient, the sufficiency of Jesus, there's a verse in the Hebrews that says, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Jesus, or I do my best and Jesus does the rest? No. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Because of the sufficiency of Jesus as our final high priest, why would we want to adopt a conspiracy theory that Hebrews 7.3 originally meant what Joseph Smith says it originally said? I mean, all the Hebrew manus manuscripts of Hebrews. Show me one that supports the Joseph Smith translation. Good grief. The academics are now at BYU, the Fair and Farms guys, Neil and Maxwell guys. They're backing off from the just. Yeah, you guys not might know this, but if you talk to a, a Kevin Barney or a professor who really knows the Joseph Smith translation, well, you think, how do you deal with the fact that Smith seems to have gone against the context, the manuscript history? He's like, well, you know, some of what he did was it restored the original text of the, in the Joseph Smith translation, but a lot of it was just inspired, creative reinterpretation, like Midrash, you know? And it's like, really? I mean, I mean, Kevin Barney, Mormon apologist, naming names here. Um, somebody asked him on a Mormon board once, um, what do you do with Revelation 1-6? And Joseph Smith translation, uh, it, well, this is a kind of a complicated story, real quick, sorry. The Joseph Smith translation actually gets it right. And at the time, Smith was more monotheistic than he later became. And so, in the KJV, it was awkward, it was poorly translated in the King James Bible, and it said something like, God and his father. Um, am I getting it right? And so, it, he actually got it right, though. That's what, that's what the Greek actually... Um, I mean, it's not God, the father, and his father. It's his God and father, that kind of thing, right? Um, and so, Kevin Barney knows Greek enough, and he's like, well, uh, no, that, that's right. Joseph Smith got it right on that in the Joseph Smith translation. Well, then, in the Sermon in the Grove in 1844... Smith preaches that God the Father has a father. And guess what proof text he uses to support that? He uses the King James Version of Revelation 1.6, which got it wrong, overturning the J Joseph Smith translation. And it's like, uh, like and the Mormon scholars are like, what do we do? Well, Kevin Barney's like, well, he just got it wrong. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Okay.
Your profit, not mine. <laughs> so if, 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 if a Mormon ever uses Revelation 1-6 to support the idea that there's a heavenly grandfather, just point him to the Joseph Smith translation. So. Um, all right, I'm getting an attitude here. So, I, um, Where am I? Okay, back to that one page I skipped accidentally. God grows his kingdom and keeps his people. Ooh, this is a fun one to go through. Open up your Bibles, please, to Matthew 13. And you're going to think, like I did when I first read this, I had, I, there's so much in the Gospels that is relevant to Christianity, duh, but to engaging Mormon theology. Even in these seemingly obscure, or not obscure, but just weird parables. Verse, we're going to start 24. I actually put those in reverse order accidentally. Verse 24, the parable of the weeds, Matthew 13. He put another parable to them, before them, and saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when plants came up and bore again, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came to him and said, Hey, master, uh, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Why do we have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, and What do you want us to do? You want us to go get them, gather them? And he said, No, no. Lest in gathering the re- weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together. Until, this is so important, let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will let the reapers gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles and to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. It is like the smallest little of all seeds. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, big, beautiful, mature tree, so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in the branches. It starts out small, and then it perpetually and gradually and steadily matures into a huge tree. Why is that important? I'll tell you in a second. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Steadily, perpetually, until. All right. Um, Go back down to 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, "Uh, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. We don't know what that means. Jesus said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age. And the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. All right, so what's the point here? The kingdom of God starts small, and it grows, and it grows spreads, and there's tears that come up. And does God start over? Does he abandon ship and start over? No. It's, just, it's okay. Let them stay there. And until the end of the age, final judgment. All right? God, perpetually. Okay. I'm going to flip back real quick to the end. I'm not going to read this stuff to you. Every single one of those three parables I just read to you was a massive threat to Joseph Smith's view of the apostasy and restoration. So he reinterpreted every single one of those three parables to to refer to the LDS church, basically, to the restoration. Wow. Read it today, please. So back back to that sheet. Now I'll just sort of summarize this instead of reading it all. John 10, Jesus says, He's the good shepherd, right? He, uh, you know, I always look at the text here so I won't misrepresent it. Matthew 10, 7. 
I am the door of the sheep, he says. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them, did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. He lays his life down for the sheep. Go to 14, John 14 verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He says in verse 26, the the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. He's not going to leave you as orphans. He's going to send you the Holy Spirit. He's the good shepherd. He lays his life down for the sheep. Chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. You can't bear good fruit apart from Jesus. You've got to plug into the vine, which, by the way, is a really good argument for salvation by grace through faith apart from works. Because you don't bear good fruit until you plug into the vine. Amen. That means doing good things isn't the means by which you plug into the vine. Get it? So, he goes on to say that um, if you abide in him, he'll bear good fruit. And his father's a good gardener. He prunes the branches. And he, he goes on to say that, um, well, in verse 15, he says, I don't call you servants anymore. The servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I've heard from the Father, I've made it known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And I appointed that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Okay, Romans 11. Sorry to just breeze through these time, time, time. Romans 11 Paul's dealing with this mass apostasy of the Jews, or they didn't receive the Messiah. But he quotes the Old Testament. God has kept a remnant for himself. Really cool verse, Ephesians 3.21. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations after the restoration. No. (laughs) Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And one of my favorites on this issue, Ephesians 5, Paul tells me, says, Aaron, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Cherish her, nourish her, wash her with the water of the word. That's what Christ does for his church. And then he says in Hebrews 12, the author says that Jesus has set up a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So just stop for a minute. And consider the cumulative effect of those with me. Just listen. In light of the way that Jesus speaks about the kingdom starting small but perpetually growing until the end. I skipped Matthew 8, 16, 18. Uh, sorry. I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, in light of the way that Jesus speaks of the kingdom, starting small, but perpetually growing into the end, of the gates of hell not prevailing against the church, of God being glorified in the church throughout all generations, of Christ nourishing and cherishing his bride, washing her with the word, of Jesus being the good shepherd over his sheep, of Jesus not abandoning his disciples as orphans, but equipping them, his friends, of Jesus being the vine and his father being the gardener, of his branches bearing fruit that abide, abides, of God being able to keep his people from stumbling, that's what Jude 1.14 says, of God keeping a remnant for himself, of Jesus setting up a kingdom that cannot be shaken, why would we want to choose a conspiracy theory of total apostasy over the promises of Jesus Christ to grow his kingdom and keep his people? I'll take the Bible, I'll take the word of God, not conspiracy theories. Hey, Jesus, you know that new covenant bride you promised to nourish and cherish and keep to yourself and keep for yourself? You let her die. No, not the new covenant bride, the old covenant bride. 
New Covenant Bride says, you're mine. I'm not letting you go. There was a bride from 180 to 1830. I promise you. Oh, yeah. Okay. John Caleb, you ready? All right, dude. In Exodus 25, 9, God told Moses, Go ahead, John. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so shall you make it. So, one of the things I like to do at Temple Square now, and if my five-year-old can do this, you guys can do this. <laughs> you guys make him feel good after he's done, please. Okay, let's, let's do this, John Caleb. You do it right here. And I want you to draw it about right, right there. There you go. And I'll hold it for you a little bit. You draw, okay? And then when you're done, we'll show everybody. How about this? We'll just put it down. And you draw it. And we'll show everybody when you're done, okay? So, you guys can do this. It's not, not hard. Six or seven pieces of furniture, a couple squares, right? This is the tabernacle. And this is really cool. You know, back sheet of a paper. In fact, if you got, guys got space, get your pens out. You can do it, all right? I, I love doing this in front of Tipple Square. I just go up to people and say, hey, can I draw you a picture of the tabernacle really quick? Can I draw something for you real quick? And they're like, okay. Okay, well, here's how Exodus speaks of the tabernacle, and it relates to the temple. There's this tent structure that God sets up. There's the tabernacle proper here. It's got two rooms and uh, a little bit of a, a veil here, an entrance here, and then more importantly, some, a veil here, a curtain. And people would come in with their animal. John Caleb likes drawing this part. The animal. And right here is the four horns where they burned it. Exactly. Good job, dude. They had an altar of Holborn offering right here with the four horns right there. And they would kill the animal. And then they would, the priest actually would kill the animal while the people who were offering up the sacrifice would put their hands on the head of the animal. Yeah. And they would burn the animal right here. And the priest would do what at that right? What would the priest do right here? It will wash his hands. The priest would wash up. Ceremonial washings right here. And twice a day, some priests, some Aaronites, would come in, and there were three pieces of furniture in the holy place here. They would serve us. Here is where the smoke. Where the smoke is. That's right. The, there's the altar. Yes. Smell really good, and here is the lampstand, and here is the table of fresh bread. Oh yeah, proud daddy. <laughs> so you got three pieces of furniture in there. You've got. I'm shaking right now. I'm so proud. Um, you got the table of showbread here, the fellowship of bread, the bread that was fresh, replaced twice a day. Priests ate it. So we had 12 cakes of bread here. I think there were two stacks of six I read somewhere. And there was the menorah, the lampstand, the candelabra, the, the candle fixture, lighting fixture. They'd, they'd service the candles on that, that puppy. And then right here, in front of the most holy place, there was a square piece of furniture right here. here. And there was... Incense on there, and it was sweet-smelling smoke, right, John Caleb? And they're inside the most holy place. What was in the most holy place? The most holy place had a box, in it, and there were two angels on top. That's right. A sacred chest called the Ark of the Covenant, and there was it a... had three things. Absolutely. They had a mercy seat on top of that sacred chest called the Ark of the Covenant, Sorry, it's hard to see from here. And uh, there was two cherubim angels on top of that. I'm not sure what they really looked like. Maybe sphinxish looking. I don't know. They had wings. They had, they had wings. <laughs> and then inside there, there were three items. There was, uh, go for it, dude. There was the. <laughs> there was the jar of manna. There was a jar of manna. And then there was the um, two tablets. Two. Then there was. The two tablets. Where the Ten Commandments were on those. And uh, then there was the Rod of Aaron. Rod of Aaron. We can say that if you want. Rod of Aaron. All right. So let's look at John Caleb's. Okay. So 
here's my, here's John Caleb's. If my son can do this, you can do this. And it's, oh yeah. Good job, buddy. You want to take it back? So the, thank you, buddy. John Caleb, you're awesome. So here, here's the significance here. It's God's word, right? It's God's tabernacle. And, uh, so it's cool to have a visual when you're evangelizing, right? It's cool to draw something out. And people get, it, they, they look and they watch. And so you could go to YouTube. You could just watch a YouTube video of like 20 times over. You'll get this really quick, six or seven pieces of furniture. And I just explain to people, you know, sacrifices twice a day at least. And uh, servicing the, the furniture in the holy place. And once a year, once a year, the high priest would come and he'd sacrifice for himself and sacrifice for the sins of the people. And he would come into the most holy place through there, and he'd come into the most holy place and he'd sprinkle blood on the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the sacred chest. So it kind of gives me a setting to talk about the Temple of Mormons because most of the time when I ask Mormons, do you believe that what you do in the temple was done in Solomon's temple? And they say, yeah, of course. Well, the tabernacle wasn't that much different from the temp temple. The, 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 the temple basically adds an annex for temple treasury. And they, add a, uh, they have uh, ten mini basins instead of just one. And they have ten candelabras and ten tables of showbread. And they've got two huge cherubim, angel army. Oh, man, just angels in the most holy place. And they've got a, success, a, a series of courts on the outside for different kinds of people who can get closer and closer. So I like to show LDS, I mean, this is not rocket science. This is not not complicated apologetic arguments. I just like to help educate Mormons. What was the tabernacle and temple like? Well, this is what they did. And so, I mean, you don't have to say anything like, your temple doesn't do this, or, you know, you don't have to note the conspicuous absence of 19th century Masonic masonry. You know, it's just... <laughs> um, and so, but it gives you a really good visual cue or setting to start talking about how Jesus fulfilled the temple. And so, um, okay, so real quickly here, this is the last section. Um, what were the main reasons for the tabernacle and temple in the Old Testament? Sacrifices. Prayer. I would say also, importantly, what's that? Fellowship, fellowship, fellowship offerings. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit centralized at the temple. They had the three tribes, north, south, east, and west. I mean, if you wanted to experience, if you wanted to be near the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, what did you do? You took a pilgrimage. You went to the temple. You went to the tabernacle. Well, in light of that, let's look through some awesome verses. By the way, can I just have you stand up for just a second? I know you guys are getting tired. Your attention spans are waning. Thank you for being kind and listening. Okay, cool. Sit down when you want. <laughs> Stay back up again. Sit back down. No. Um, so, the temple, the presence of God, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, centralized. Centralized. So, at the edge of your seat, listen to this. John 1, the Word, Jesus and the word became flesh. God became man, not man became God. Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word dwell there, the root of it, basically means tabernacled. Jesus, God in the flesh, tabernacled. Oh, something's happening. Something's going on. John 2. Jesus comes into the temple, cleanses it with the whip he made himself premeditatively, and uh, drives out the money changers, and the temple authorities say, Hey, what sign, what miracle will you do to show us you have the right to do this? 
And Jesus, uh, probably with a Rob Savolka face at the moment, says, Tear down this temple, and I'll raise it again in three days! He's mad, right? And the Jews said, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it again in three days? But the temple he was speaking of was, and I stop and I ask the Mormon, what do you think? The temple he was speaking of was his body. And it says after this, and the disciples remembered this after Jesus rose from the dead and they believed. John 4, oh my goodness, we got a theme here. John 4, Jesus is gently, sometimes Jesus plays a trumpet, sometimes he plays a flute. He's playing a flute here, softly. He's speaking to the Samaritan woman, and the Samaritan woman says, I can perceive that you are a prophet. Um, our fathers worship on this mountain. She's a Samaritan, I think it's Northern Kingdom related. Uh, there was a dispute, Northern Southern Kingdom. God, I think, really showed his favor in the Southern Kingdom, Judah. Just, the Samaritan woman's like, hey, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but in Jerusalem is where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on that mountain nor on this mountain in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews, so he's not you know, flattening it out to the degree where he's saying there is no exclusivity in, in, in Judaism. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship in the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must, spirit, must, must worship in spirit and in truth. So I read this book by Andrew Skinner, BYU professor on temple worship. It's called Temple Worship. And he talks, I think quoting Brigham Young about this dream, this vision, this, this optimism that someday LDS temples are going to dot the globe, all the valleys, all the mountains. And I guarantee you, if the LDS church could, they would build a temple in Jerusalem. And I guarantee you, if the LDS church could, they'd build a, a temple in Samaria. And Chip, if that ever happens, let's go, let's go to the temple opening and let's just yell out, neither on that mountain, nor on this mountain. I'm with you. All right. God is spirit, not on that mountain. So I'm in front of Manti Temple, I say, not on that mountain, not on this mountain. Then it got more of a theme. In John 7, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stands up and cries out, If anyone thirsts, this is just good evangelism stuff here. Just say it. Memorize it. Quote it. It's awesome. The drawing words of Jesus. I mean, you hear it. They hear it. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this, John says, he, had, he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were, future tense, to receive. For as yet, the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Was the Holy Spirit at work in the Old Testament? Was he circumcising hearts? Was he recreating hearts? Was he... Enabling people to have faith and be holy and persevere to the end. Yeah. But was he indwelling the believers of the Old Testament like he indwelled David or the temple? And there's, it's pretty particular in the Old Testament. Spirit's here, spirit indwelling here. Jesus says the spirit is with you and he will be in you. John 14. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Oh, I, I, I conflated those two passages. You know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not proof texting here in such a way as to take a few passages out of context. I mean, this is a theme in the Gospel of John. Jesus, the temple, 
Jesus, the temple, spirit to be given, neither on that mountain nor on this mountain. Matthew, three passages. Matthew 12, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a grain of, uh, or field of grain fields <laughs> on the Sabbath. And they start picking heads of grain, the disciples do, and eating them. It's kind of nasty, by the way. Um, the Pharisees saw, it's the Sabbath, you can't do that. And uh, Jesus says, uh, didn't you read the Old Testament where it says David got hungry and those who were with him, how he entered, remember that? He entered the house of God, the holy place, and he ate the bread of the presence, the bread from the table of showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Haunting, 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 awesome words. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. I love saying that in the streets of Manti. Something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple is here. It's like a movie. Oh, what is it? What is it? <laughs> Matthew 24. Jesus was leaving the temple with his disciples, and his disciples said, Oh, Jesus, aren't the buildings of the temple beautiful? And Jesus said, uh, It's all going to burn. He says, Not one stone will be left standing upon another. Wow. And on the cross, when Jesus was on the cross, cried out with a loud voice, He's not a stoic. He's not a machine. He's human. He's God become flesh. He cries out with a loud voice. Yields up his spirit. And Matthew says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split. This really disturbs Mormons when you ask them, why was the temple veil torn in two when Jesus was on the cross? What do you think the meaning of that was? There was a lady on a uh, Mormon, one of the top Mormon message boards like a month or two ago that said, well, the LDS church has restored the veil. And it's like, no. <laughs> the temple, the temple as regards the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, was the Hoover Dam. If you wanted to go drink, you took a pilgrimage to the temple. Right? When Jesus was on the cross, the Hoover Dam fundamentally cracked. So, whoosh, and the God held back the waters. Then, weeks later, at Pentecost, Acts 2, at that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind that should remind you of Moses on the mountain, right? And it filled the whole entire house. Oh, that, that should remind you of Solomon dedicating the first temple. It was awesome. I wanted to tell you worship leaders here. I mean, they had Levites that were specially in charge of, like, basically doing a, you know, a concert when they dedicated the temple. And it was awesome, and, and they, they sang, and they prayed, and they read, and smoke filled the temple. What a concert, right? Oh, oh. It filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then Peter goes on to preach, because, you know, they're like, what's going on with you guys? You've been drinking? And Peter's like, hey, it's only like nine in the morning. It's not early enough to drink. Because <laughs> they're filled with the Spirit, and they're like, what's going on here? And Peter starts to preach. And he says, don't you remember in the Old Testament? In the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Hoover Dam. broken open. Why in the world would we want to rebuild that Hoover Dam? Ah. Ah. The veil has been torn into. Something greater than the temple is here. Tear 
down this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. So, I'm going to skip those two passages, but how does the New Testament now speak of the temple? A couple ways. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, and this has nothing to do with not smoking. This has nothing to do with kosher laws. This has definitely nothing to do with trying to have Old Testament-like kosher laws for the way you live and constrictively can or cannot eat certain things. It's the exact opposite of that, right? The whole chapter is about the unity of the body of Christ and the purity of ministry on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Nothing to do with coffee, nothing to do with alcohol, nothing to do with tattoos, all right? <laughs> this is about the body of Jesus Christ, corporate body of Jesus Christ. Do you not know, Paul says, that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? God bless him. I'll say, I won't say his name because he's, a, he's a, he, not yet, right? Because give him some time here. Just came back from his LDS mission in August. On the streets with us last week, witnessing to Mormons. Praise God. We got to hear his story. Oh my goodness. We got to hear his story at length. The pavilion. Oh, wow. God is at work. And he sees the stake president here, local. And he has two young men with him. And the stake president is pointing at me or Alex and out. Al oh, goodness. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, dude. Sorry. Um, so he says to the stake president, Are you pointing to me? No, we're pointing to Aaron. And he goes, Are, are you with Aaron? It came with Aaron, and take present, tells his two young men, see, Aaron brings apostates with him. And, uh, and my, my, my new friend here, I'll call, let's call him that, my new friend. Um, I, I don't know exactly how the conversation went, but I know, I know this much. Um, he looked at him, and he, the state president looked at him and said, did you serve a mission? He said, yes, I did. I came back last August. He says, did you go through the temple? He said, yes, I did. He said, did you, so you made temple covenants, and you're violating those right now. And he said, I think God understands. And uh, the state president says, well, these two men are going to serve honorable missions. You know, it's very, very condescending. But, and, um, and, you know, they're not going to violate their temple covenants, right? And one thing, I, I forget the details, but my new friend, he, he tells the two young men, he says, you guys have got to read Hebrews. Because it's like, I was on my mission, and I wanted to know more about the temple. And so I flipped the back of my quad and the topical guide, and it pointed me back to Hebrews. And I was like, what's up with this? I went through a temple prep class. Nothing preparing me for the temple ever mentioned Hebrews. He says, I read that. And it says that Christ has entered the true temple. He's, he has, through a new and living way, given us the ability to go straight into the presence of God with confidence. And, uh, and the state president said to his young men, see, even he agrees that the New Testament talks about the temple. And, and, and my friend, new friend says, no, no. He goes, I am the temple. <laughs> <laughs> and the thousand angels who were watching with popcorns, <laughs> Where is the temple in Manti? It is not on the hill, it's on the street. You guys have come to do work for the dead on the street. You are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you. Wow! Ephesians 2, Paul says, you're no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay, let's see what these apostles and prophets are teaching. Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows and grows into 
the holy temple in the Lord, into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are being built together into a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? The temple has come to the temple to do work for the dead. <laughs> and we, 2 Corinthians says, will be brought together, together in the presence of God. We are sealed together by faith in Jesus. That's amazing. Everything, the LD, everything good the LDS temple offers me, I already have in Christ. That's awesome. He's my green apron. He's my covering. <laughs> I'm serious. When I die, he is my covering. Jesus is my temple clothing. Jesus is my temple covering. If you say, Aaron, are you worthy to enter the presence of God? I'll say, Jesus is my temple recommend. I'm not worthy. Jesus is my temple recommend. Jesus is my sign. He's my token. He has entered into the inner circle of prayer. He is my second anointing. He's my sealing. Everything good that I can have in the temple, I already have in Jesus. Hebrews says, the earthly, summarizing, the earthly tabernacle and temple created by human hands was just a shadow and a copy of the true heavenly temple, which is not of this creation. You want to know how you have an older new covenant temple? Tell me where it is. If you say it's on earth, then you got an old covenant temple. If you say in heaven, oh, you might have a new covenant temple. Was your temple built by construction workers? Then you have an old covenant temple or something supposed to be like it. In Hebrews 8, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man, 9-11. But when Christ appeared as, the, as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent. I love to see the temple, right? The greater temple, the more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, securing an eternal redemption, 923. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified by these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices into these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God in our behalf. The law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. Okay, let's read. Almost done here. A Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 14, 10, 14. For by a single, okay, we'll stop here, sorry. A couple things. Mormons many times think of doing the sacrament every week as a renewal of the baptismal covenant. So depending on what Mormon you're talking to, a lot of Mormons think that they're actually being re-forgiven at the sacrament. Depends on what kind of spectrum they fall on. Uh, you know, there's obvious, the obvious question is, well, how can you be forgiven through something like that if you haven't completed the repentance process? And so Mormonism has conflicting answers on that. But they think of going to the temple and doing sacrament as covenant renewal, making covenants over and over and over and over again. And that somehow, somehow someday, they'll finally be right with God after repeat covenant renewal. Well, what were they doing in the Old Testament? Every year, more blood. Every year, renewing the covenant. A high priest offering sins for himself, or offering sacrifices for his own sins, his own people, and, his, and the Israelite people. And it was never enough. You couldn't renew that covenant for a billion years and it somehow become finally effective. Well, Jesus does not want you to think of the new covenant as something that you have to renew. It is established. 
He performed a sacrifice and then sat down at the right hand of God. It is finished. So, 1014. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Wow! This covenant isn't the kind of covenant where the priest has to renew, 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 renew. He, he's that good of a priest once. One offering perfected for all the time, those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to us, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. In those days, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, and here's a phrase I want you to focus on. Verse 20, by the new and living way that he has opened for us. So emphasize with your Mormon neighbors. There's a new and living way God has opened for us to come into the presence of God. A new and living way. Through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance with faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay. Let me ask you a question. When the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in AD 70, Christians were, we probably had an element of sadness over that, right? But do you think they, they thought, oh no, we can't enter the presence of God anymore. We can't have forgiveness of sins. We can't have the fullest blessings of the gospel. The destruction of the temple in AD 70 was a boon, not a bane to Christianity. In light of how the Old Testament specifies the tabernacle and temple, in light of how Christ spoke of its destruction, in light of how Christ spoke of an hour coming when the true worshipers would worship neither on this nor on that mountain, but by the Spirit to be given, in light of Jesus telling us something greater than the temple is here, in light of the temple veil being torn in two, in light of Christ having entered the true temple, having performed the final sacrifice, in light of the new and living way to enter the presence of God, in light of Paul teaching that we are the temple indwelled by the Spirit, why choose a conspiracy theory that says New Testament Christians somehow had a directive since lost and restored to build temples replete with a veil and rituals resembling, just so happened, 19th century Freemasonry. Like I said, Jesus is my temple recommend. And I already have everything in Jesus, everything good that the temple, LDS temple offers me. So, um, I just want to go back to the first page in closing. You don't have to look at it, but I just want to encourage you here that you'll remember 99%, I'm sorry, you'll forget 99% of what I just said, probably, but you'll remember 1%. And so you need to be confident. Well, God's going to use the sentences I just spoke from the word of God to encourage you to do a good work, right? Well, you know what? God's going to use your sentences out there on the street to make an impact. You are God's ripple effect. And I would just, I challenge you to pick three sentences from the Bible or biblical sentences, whatever, from one topic and remember them. Memorize them. And be confident that God will use your little sentences 